afternoon. Um, my name is Josh Cox. I'm a researcher at the Regional Educational Laboratory, Northeastern Islands. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules um, to attend today's webinar, uh, Measuring Students' Social and Emotional Learning, a Review of Instruments and Implications for State and Local Education Agencies. I'll begin with a brief ag agenda of what we'll be covering today. Um, first, I'm going to begin by introducing my co-presenters. Um, next, I'm going to provide an overview of our findings from our recently published report, a review of instruments for measuring social and emotional learning skills among secondary school students. After I provide that overview, I have some questions that I'm going to ask representatives from Champlain Valley School District who partnered with us on the report. Um, in that discussion, Champlain Valley will offer some insight into their efforts to develop their student social emotional learning skills, including how the district might use some of the findings from the report that I'll be discussing. Afterward, we'll open it up to any questions that you have regarding the report's findings or Champlain Valley School District's efforts to support their students' SEL. And finally, we'll wrap up the presentation by inviting you to complete a short survey to evaluate your experience participating in this webinar. All right, I want to introduce today's presenters. Um, so I'm joined by my colleague and the director of the Regional Education Laboratory Northeastern Islands, Dr. Julie Reardon. I'm also lucky to be joined by representatives from Champlain Valley School District, and that includes CVSD's Director of Learning and Innovation, Jeff Evans, as well as CVSD's Director of Behavior Systems, C Cassandra Townshend. And as I mentioned earlier, my name is Josh Cox. I'm a researcher for the REL, and uh, a co-lead for the REL's uh, Social and Emotional Learning Research Alliance. Um, more to come ab about that alliance soon. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the goals for today. Um, so first, uh, we'd like to help you to learn about the availability of instruments measuring collaboration, perseverance, and self-regulated learning in secondary school students. Second, we'd like to help you learn about the intended uses of the instruments. Third, we'd like to, you to learn about the availability of reliability and validity information for the instruments. And last, we'd like to explore the implications of the information presented, including how Champlain Valley School District and other districts can use the resource. Before we proceed, I just want to mention that this work was conducted under the Regional Educational Laboratory, Northeastern Islands. The Regional Educational Laboratory Northeastern Islands is one of 10 regional educational laboratories across the country that's funded by the Institute of Education Sciences at the U.S. Department of Education uh, to conduct applied research and trainings with a mission of supporting a more uh, evidence-based education system. One way that we conduct our work is by partnering with practitioners to focus on their research or technical assistance needs related to a specific topic area. The work that I'm about to present was conducted under our Social and Emotional Learning Research Alliance, who helped us to create a research agenda focused on topics that I'm sure many of you are thinking about when trying to develop your students' social and emotional learning skills. Those topics include measurement, supports for SEL in and out of school, instructional strategies, and professional learning for teachers and other staff. Before we proceed, I, I w I'd like to open it up to a poll to get a sense from our practitioners in the audience whether you're currently using or considering using an instrument to measure social emotional learning skills. So can we open that poll? And so the question is, are you currently using an instrument to measure social and emotional learning skills in your school or district? And the response options are yes, considering or making plans to do so, no, and no plans to do so. And finally, can, you can indicate NA if you don't work in a school or district. All right, thank you so much for your responses. Um, it looks like many of you are at least thinking about uh, using an instrument to measure student social emotional learning skills. All right, that's great. Um, and I hope this webinar and the resource that I'm about to present will help to inform those plans. So uh, today I'm going to discuss our recently published resource, a review of instruments for measuring social and emotional learning skills among secondary school students. This work was authored by Brandon Foster, David Bannett, and myself. I want to note that the resource includes a systematic review of instruments measuring three social and emotional learning skills. 
More specifically, our review identified instruments measuring collaboration, perseverance, and self-regulated learning. We also looked at the availability of reliability and validity information for those instruments that were included in our re review. And I hope that this resource will be helpful in introducing you to some of the instruments that can be used to measure social emotional learning skills, as well as some important considerations that you should be thinking about when selecting instruments. Let's start with a little bit of background. Um, so we conducted this work in partnership with Champlain Valley School District in Vermont. Uh, Jeff Evans, who I introduced earlier, is also a member of the uh, core planning group for the RELS Social Emotional Learning Research Alliance. And a little bit about CVSD, uh, they've been implementing both proficiency-based learning as well as personalized learning plans for quite some time. And as part of that work, they're currently implementing standards related to social and emotional learning skills. Jeff identified a need for this review of instruments to help inform the development of CVSD's assessment systems, both formative and summative, in an effort to help the district to be able to measure and track students' social emotional learning skills. What ty types of skills was CVSD interested in measuring? Um, well, let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the project. Um, initially, Jeff uh, at CVSD reached out and provided us with this mission statement that the district had recently developed. Um, Jeff, can I have you talk a little bit about the evolution of this document and the specific SEL skills your district was focused on? Yeah, absolutely. So hello from Vermont, where, by the way, it is snowing right now, so we can give you that little winter wonderland backdrop to our work. Uh, so yes, as Josh mentioned, um, about five years ago, our state um, passed a law that requires students in the year 2020 and beyond to graduate based on demonstrating proficiency on a set of graduation standards uh, and also um, have personalized learning be a big piece of that. And so it was incumbent upon our district to create um, a document that represents our expectations for graduation. So we took a number of um, national standards and created a, the document that you're looking at now. I know it's hard to decipher because of the size of the font. So I'll describe a little bit of it. Um, what we did was we took our mission statement and, uh, and then conflated that with the graduation standards. And this graphic has five leaves, what we call them, which are categories for our graduation standards. And the categories from top to bottom our self-direction, creative and practical problem solving, informed and integrative thinking, clear and effective communication, and responsible and involved citizenship. And the two that are circled are really uh, pretty specific to typically uh, referred to as non-academic skills or soft skills or what we often call habits of learning. And so uh, at the time, I was the principal of the high school in this district and we were struggling with coming up with any kind of reliability when it came to um, assessing a student's self-direction or responsible citizenship. And so that's when we partnered, um, or it was about the time that we partnered with REL to ask them, you know, what kind of measurements can we rely on uh, to, to inform our instruction and to form our decisions around determining graduation based on demonstrated proficiency? And so in the self-direction um, leaf, there are three standards that talk about things like taking initiative and responsibility for learning, making informed decisions, setting goals, taking constructive risks, and uh, demonstrating growth mindset and persevering. And under responsible and involved citizenship, participation and collaborating effectively and respectively, taking responsibility for personal, personal decisions, demonstrating respect for different cultures, values, and points of view, and demonstrating a commitment to community and personal well-being. So those are the standards that live within those two leaves that we call. Um, and so when we worked with Josh and Rel, we coalesced all of those into the three areas that Josh already referenced, um, collaboration, perseverance, and self-regulation. So that's me, Josh, thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, so, and, and, and Jeff has sort of uh, already talked briefly about this, but um, so while these terms self-direction and responsible involved citizenship that um, CVSD was using really make a lot of sense in the context of their mission statement, 
um, we weren't consistently finding them used in the research literature. Um, and we did, however, recognize that there were some terms that were commonly used in the research literature that aligned with the components that were laid out uh, for those terms, self-direction and responsible and involved citizenship. And so taking initiative in and responsibility for learning is really aligned to a term in the research literature called self-regulated learning. Um, persevering when challenged is represented by the term perseverance in the research literature. And finally, collaborating effectively and respectfully to enhance the learning environment is just collaboration in the research literature. And so we settled on these three constructs, self-regulated learning, collaboration, and perseverance. And we felt that these really mapped nicely from the components uh, covered under self-direction and responsible and involved citizenship, the terms that are more commonly used in the research literature. And I suspect that some of your schools and districts might also be interested in some of the social emotional learning skills like collaboration, perseverance, and self-regulated learning. So let's just return to the purpose of this resource, um, which is really to support stakeholders to, um, one, be able to identify available instruments for measuring collaboration, perseverance, and self-regulated learning, and two, to understand information about reliability and validity that's available for each of those instruments. Again, CDSD expects to use the resource to inform the development of its assessment system related to measuring and tracking students' social emotional learning skills. And additionally, we hope that schools and districts nationwide can draw on the report uh, to identify and vet assessments for use uh, with SEL programs and non-academic uh, data collection. All right, so I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but I do just want to call out that uh, for each of the instruments reviewed, the report identifies whether information was available for reliability and seven components of validity. Um, you can see the seven components of validity listed here, and I'll let you look at the report if you're interested in the definitions for each of those components of validity. I will just quickly define reliability and validity here, though. So reliability refers to whether the instrument consistently measures the skills across respondents, time, or raters. And validity refers to whether an instrument measures what it, is, what it intends to measure and whether the inferences made from the instrument are appropriate. All right, so how did we identify instruments? Uh, the first bullet, I've already talked pretty extensively about why we looked for instruments that measured these three specific skills. But again, I'll just say, say it again, uh, that we were looking for instruments measuring one of the three targeted social emotional learning skills, and those are collaboration, uh, perseverance, and self-regulated learning. Uh, CVSD was also specifically interested in identifying measures uh, for secondary school students, and that's another requirement for this resource. The instrument needed to be used with a population of secondary school students in the United States. Because we wanted to make sure that the, resource, uh, that the resources that we were presenting uh, were accessible to practitioners, they had to be publicly available online at uh, no or low cost. And we also needed to introduce some parameters around the time frame for when the instru instrument was developed. And so the time frame that we used was from 1994 to 2017. Uh, 2017 was the year we started our search, and 1994 was the year that the term social emotional learning was coined by a group of researchers, practitioners, and policymakers. Uh, finally, we decided to not include instruments that were published as part of a doctoral dissertation because those instruments often don't see the level of scrutiny as other instruments typically published in peer review journals. All right, now let's talk a little bit about the instruments that we found. Um, in total, we identified 16 instruments measuring at least one of our three targeted skills. For collaboration, we found five instruments. Three of these were self-report surveys. One was a performance-based assessment, and one was a teacher report survey. Uh, for perseverance, uh, we found four student self-report surveys. For self-regulated learning, we found four student self-report surveys. And finally, we found three student self-report surveys that measured both perseverance and self-regulated learning. All right, so actually, can I open it up to, uh, to the next poll? Now I want to check in with, uh, with those of you that are interested in measuring your students' social emotional learning skills. So I just want to pull you again. Um, if you're currently using or planning to use an instrument to measure social and emotional learning skills, how do you plan to use the results? And so there are three categories, research use, formative use, summative use. Um, I think these terms are probably somewhat familiar to all of you. Um, 
but I've also offered a short description of each. Um, with research use, uh, the intention is to use resu results produced by the instrument to describe these skills for a particular population or to examine relationships. With formative use, the intention is to use re results produced by the instrument to inform instructional change that can influence positive change in students. And lastly, with summative use, the intention is to assign a final rating or score to each student by comparing each student against the standard or benchmark. OK, it looks like the majority of us uh, are interested in formative instruments uh, and with a few that are interested in research, uh, instruments used for research purposes. OK, can we go back to the slides now? OK. Uh, so for the instruments that we found, uh, let's look at um, uh, the intended uses as described by the instrument's developers. So among the 16 instruments identified, 11 were developed for use in research, 5 were developed for formative instruction, and none of the information collected suggested that any of the instruments should be used for summative purposes. Now that last bullet is really important, and I think it's probably expected for two reasons. First, instruments used for summative purposes require more stringent reliability and validity evidence. And second, many instruments measuring social emotional learning skills are fairly new, and instrument developers and researchers are still collecting evidence on their reliability and validity. Okay, so over the next few, few slides, I've identified the names of the instruments measuring each skill. Um, I'm sure you're going to notice that some of the names are somewhat generic. Um, I'm going to blame that on the creativity of uh, our instruments developers. Um, that being said, let's start with collaboration. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we, we identified five instruments measuring collaboration. And four of the, the instruments were used in research. And one of the instruments, the teamwork scale, was used for formative instruction. Again, we identified four instruments measuring perseverance. Uh, three of those instruments were developed for use in research. And one of the instruments, the expectancy value cost scale, was developed for formative instruction. We identified four instruments measuring self-regulated learning. Two of those instruments were developed for use in research, and two instruments the Junior Metacognitive Awareness Inventory and the Self-Regulation Strategy Inventory was developed for use in formative instruction. Finally, uh, three of the instruments measure both perseverance and self-regulated learning. Two of these instruments were developed for use in research, and one instrument, the Motivated Strategies for Learning Questionnaire, was developed for use in formative research. For each of the instruments that we identified, we also indicated whether reliability and validity information was available for the instrument. And so that's what you're seeing in this table. Along the left side, you'll see each of the 16 instruments. And to the right of the instrument name, you'll see columns indicating the availability of information for reliability and seven components of validity that I mentioned earlier. And so for each of these instruments, we used a filled in dot to indicate the information was available and an open dot to indi indicate the information was not available for each component. Now, I just want to note that availability of information does not necessarily mean that the instrument is reliable and or valid. It just means that we have information to help us inform about reliability or specific component of validity. So let's talk about some trends. First, it's no noteworthy that all instruments had information on reliability. All instruments also had information on content validity, and many had information on structural validity, external validity, and consequential validity. It's important to note, however, uh, that no instruments had information on substantive validity. And this is important since substantive validity is necessary to understand whether students process instruments' questions or tasks as the developer intended. And so if students aren't understanding the content of questions, I think you'll agree that that's that's problematic. And so we would have liked to see these instruments offer some evidence of substantive validity. It's also important to note that only three of the 16 instruments had information on fairness. Uh, and fairness 
is important because it helps us to understand whether a measure is valid for comparing scores between different subgroups of students. And so this speaks to whether a measure is biased against some groups of students. And so again, we would have liked to see these instruments offer some evidence of, um, uh, of fairness. And finally, I'll just quickly call out uh, that only five instruments had information on generalizability. And you can see the definition here. Um, generalizability refers to whether scores from the measure correlate with other modes of measurement for the same skill. And so an example of that uh, would be a student self-report instrument measuring perseverance that's also correlated with a teacher report uh, measure for perseverance. And so this really helps us to understand validity overall, which is to say that the instrument measures what it intends to measure. Now, um, I want to open it up to another poll here. And I, I suspect that um, as I'm talking about some of these second metric terms, uh, that there may be some confusion about what some of these terms mean. And so I just want to get a read on the audience. What is your level of familiarity with psychometric terms such as substantive validity um, and consequential validity? Um, so do you recognize these terms and understand them well? Do you just recognize them, don't recognize them? OK. All right. So as I suspected, um, it, it looks like some of you are not incredibly familiar with some of these terms. And so I, I want to reassure you that first, you know, we define these terms in the resource, but also we've developed a worksheet for schools and districts um, that can be used to help you better understand those components of validity and reliability that might be most important to your school or district. And so um, I'll, I'll just begin with the, the first page of this worksheet. And so it begins by asking some overarching questions to help your school or district identify an initial list of instruments. And so it asks about the specific skills that are to be measured. Um, and you know, those could include collaboration, perseverance, or self-regulated learning. It also asks about your target group of respondents. So are you looking to implement the measure with high school students or other types of students? It also asks schools to identify your purpose for using the instrument. Um, and so all of these questions really help your school or district to narrow in on what you want to get out of an instrument. Then we move on to questions that help you to better understand what components of reliability and validity might be most important to your school district. And so using the highlighted cells here as an example, you can see that in the first column, we begin by asking the question, are you interested in connecting your students' social and emotional learning skills scores to other consequential outcomes, such as achievement scores, graduation rates, and attendance? Now, if your school indicates that yes, you are interested in connecting the SEL scores with consequential outcomes, then in the right column, we inform you that you should con consider information presented in Appendix B for consequential validity. Uh, we also direct you to relevant tables within the body of the report. And the goal here is to clue readers into the specific components of reliability and validity that are most important to them, and then also direct the reader to the sections of the report that provide information about those components. And so we really hope that this worksheet can help our readers to make use of our, our review. All right, now that I've shared key findings from the report, uh, I'm, I'm going to transition to a conversation uh, with our representatives from Champlain Valley School District. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're lucky uh, to be joined by Jeff Evans, uh, CVSD's Director of Learning and Innovation and Cassandra Townshend, uh, CVSD's Director of Behavior Systems. Um, Jeff, I'd like to start with you. Um, I was hoping that maybe you could tell us, uh, before we dive into more substantive questions, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about your district. Perhaps you could share a little bit about the community uh, and the students that you serve. Sure. So we are in the Burlington area, of, uh, or the Champlain Valley in Vermont, and we have um, six schools in our system. We have about 4,000 students total, which, believe it or not, is the largest system in our state. We're a very small state. Um, and we have a pretty wide range of um, socioeconomic uh, positioning. And we also have, um, I'm trying to think, about 450 or so faculty members, about 1,000 
employees total when you count up staff and faculty um, throughout our district. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that we're in a state that um, now requires proficiency-based learning. Um, our district had actually started that work about three or four years in advance of the law, and so therefore um, we feel as though we're, uh, we're pretty pleased with the trajectory we've had and that we feel like we're a pretty highly functioning system with a, with a transition that has been um, significant and challenging at times. Hey Jeff, um, could you talk to us a little bit about um, what the district has been doing to support SEL over the last couple of years since developing the competencies that you identified in that mission statement? Sure, if you could put that next slide up there, that'll help me do that. Um, so we started this partnership um, with REL. We started having the conversations about 2016. And so in the time that has passed since then, we've evolved quite a bit around how we think about social emotional learning. Um, and so I'm going to look at specifically some things the high school has done in that time. And the first thing is they created what they call an engagement survey that they give all their students. They have about 1,300 students in their high school. And they give it to them twice a year. And the survey asks a range of questions aimed at finding out how connected students feel to the school community, how engaged they feel, what kind of relationships they have with the adults in the building and with their peers. And so a number of the questions are academic in nature, but also many of them are social emotional in nature as well. Um, and what they do is they've built a platform where uh, it creates a scoring range. And actually, this screen is inaccurate. They've made some changes. The scoring range now is from 0 to 17. And the higher the score, the greater concern. And I'd like to just tell a quick story um, that I heard yesterday. This past Friday, the high school gave their first round of the engagement survey. They do this through advisories. We all have, uh, we have an advisory system where every student has a teacher who is an advisor of theirs. And each advisor has about 12 students, three from each grade. And uh, students all took the survey at the same time in the morning. And in the afternoon, the principal got onto this platform. And immediately, he could do a search for uh, the students who had the highest concern scores. Um, and he noticed a few. And he started digging in and looking at the actual responses from students. And there was a student in particular that concerned him that he did not know. He got up, went and found the advisor of this student, had a conversation. The advisor was quite surprised by the responses. This girl presented as a very high-functioning, um, quiet student um, who was doing quite well in school. And so then they decided, well, let's just go find her and have a quick conversation with her. Um, they realized that she had left the building without um, notifying anyone. And they then called the parents. And the parents were unaware that she had left. Um, they searched for her. They eventually found her and had a conversation with her. And it was revealed that you know the girl has struggled with depression in the past, has had therapy, um, had stopped taking her meds for quite some time, and was having some pretty despondent thoughts. And so um, they were able to respond to this information immediately, information we never had in the past. This girl would have flown under the radar for years, quite possibly. And so this particular, um, this particular construct has been really useful. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about how Josh's work um, can, can combine with the work that the high school is doing to enhance that. Um, but that's one of the things that the high school has done now. Um, and also, another thing is they started a program just this past year we call RISE is around personalized learning experiences where the last two weeks of the school year are shut down, um, the school year is over, and the last two weeks are used for passion-based student interest um, experiences. So every teacher teaches a, uh, something they're passionate about. Students get to, through surveys, identify passion. They also get to do independent projects. Of the 1,300 students, about 250 did independent projects. We work with community partners in doing this. And it's a, basically, it's a two-week curriculum based around these passions. 
and everybody has to create learning targets per our um, proficiency-based system. And every teacher um, who designs a, an experience has to design a learning target or two that are specific to one of our, um, our leaves around self-direction or responsible citizenship. And so now we are embedding this into the uh, classroom experience as well. Um, and so that has, that has been pretty exciting. And it's the first time that we've really put um, responsible citizenship and the self-direction standards um, at the center of the experience. They've been sort of peripheral and causal in the past, but this is an experience where it really is a focus of a lot of the learning. Um, and then finally, I'll point out, and there's a lot more than three things, but I want to point out the three primary um, evolutions. The third thing is, in the time since we started this work with REL, we've adopted the CASEL competencies. I'm sure many of the folks in this audience are aware, are, are familiar with them. So they have their big five competencies, and so we're doing sort of a crosswalk between our language that we put in our standards and that REL used in their, um, in their report with the language that we're now using. And we find a, lot, a very tight alignment there, um, but we're starting to embed these competencies in our PLC work that we do every week with our uh, faculty and staff and embedding it into a lot of our classroom instruction as well. So those are some of the things that we've done since then, and I'll talk a little later about how this report can inform that. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so there is a question from Jim Vetter that we received in the, uh, the chat, and it's, uh, it's, since CVSD has adopted the five CASEL SEL competencies, what led you to focus on assessing the three specific constructs that you selected rather than assessing the broader range of SEL competencies? And I think that really kind of speaks to where uh, CVSD was at the time. I think that you were really focused in on uh, you know, the responsible and involved citizenship and self-direction, and then we translated those into the research literature at that point in time. Um, but since then, I think you're kind of speaking to this, Jeff, that since then, uh, CVSD has sort of transitioned to adopting the CASEL-5, um, and so you're sort of making that transition using, uh, by doing these crosswalks of the, the terminology. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a matter of timing. When we started to work with REL, we had not yet adopted uh, CASEL, and so since then, we have been uh, having those conversations about how to do this crosswalk, crosswalk rather. Great. Um, the next question that I have is, is for Cassandra. Um, and so when we initially started working together, I believe that you were mostly focused on measuring SEL in your secondary school students. Um, do you have plans to track those skills in other grade levels as well? Absolutely, Josh, yes. Um, we've made some great momentum in um, establishing SEL as a district priority, clearly, um, and really having the need and the desire to expand beyond just the high school. Um, at CVSD, our K-8 schools um, are all implementing positive behavior interventions and supports, PBIS, and that is very similar um, and a wonderful framework that we have discovered um, to really help our students and our younger students engage in social emotional learning practices through that framework. So we don't see PBIS as contrary. In fact, it's very complementary to, to SEL work, um, especially in our K-8 schools. And so having that consistency across our K-8 schools is allowing us at different buildings um, to look at what are we teaching around social emotional learning around those um, CASEL fives? How are we measuring those? We look at um, some of our schools are doing some universal screeners to identify additional um, targeted or tier two supports for students needing a little bit more. Um, some of those, for example, are the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. We've had some schools engage in that as a universal screener. We've also had some of our schools engage in the student risk screening scale. Um, which really is a simple tool that helps to identify, as Jeff mentioned previously, sort of identifying those internalizers. When we think about behavior, it's not only what we see on the outside, but often what's really going on with students internally. So we're building on what our schools are currently doing and then really expanding our knowledge base as we continue to move forward with SEL as a K-8 K and K-12 district. And I can add just a little bit there, too. Um, Josh, our, right now our grades 5 through 8 
all have common learning targets. Um, they're academic and social emotional. And so um, teachers are, are continuously communicating with students and families about those standards that live within the, um, the SEL leaves that we call. Thank you. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about maybe what you learned from the process of working together on this report, including um, how you might use the report's findings. So yeah, if you go to the next slide, I can address that. Thank you. So um, I met with the high school folks not too long ago and we started looking at the report. And we are still in the process of uh, initially digesting the report and looking at the measures that you, uh, I'm sorry, the tools that you measure. Um, but some of the possibilities that have come out, excuse me, of those meetings are as follows. In the engagement survey, that's a pretty fluid um, construct right now that we're constantly revising. And so we, we want to use some of this information in the report to inform revisions as we move forward with this survey. And I want to add that the survey used to be high school only. Now it's being given in our K-8s as well for the first time this fall. Uh, also, probably more importantly, is that when we get concern scores that I referenced earlier, we need a response. We need a systemic response to those scores. And uh, we are hoping that these tools that you analyzed can help us dig deeper and get more information about students who have uh, for lack of a better term, popped on this um, survey and, uh, and gotten on our radar screen in terms of us building response plans for them. So we're really excited about that because um, right now it has, been, um, it has been a bit of a struggle to know exactly how to respond and who, whom should respond, um, but they're building those response protocols and uh, looking at the possibility of using these tools as part of those protocols. The other thing is we constantly revise these learning targets and scales that just started, we've just started this process for RISE, and these tools can help us um, do that as well. And then we really think it's going to be helpful as we continue to look at universal screeners and how we gather information uh, with our CASEL work uh, moving forward throughout the district. Thanks, Jeff. Um... Cassandra, I was going to ask a little bit about maybe your future plans related to SEL at CVSD, and I, I believe that you're actually working on some continuous improvement process plans. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's accurate. Um, one of the things that we've really worked hard at is making SEL a priority. So it is actually in our continuous improvement plan so that we're all working from the same um, lens and priority because we feel that it is incredibly valuable to do that. Um, other um, future activities definitely in, will include involving community families, community families, stakeholders in this process. Social emotional learning, as, as we all know, it's, it's not just an isolated 50-minute course that you take once a day. It's really embedded in all that we do and has to be um, priorit prioritized across the curriculum. One of the things that we're really focusing on now that we have a sense of assessment we're looking at specifically how are we developing district-wide social-emotional learning standards? Um, because we can assess all day long, but how do we know we're explicitly teaching to those five CASEL um, competencies? And so that's some of the future work is really thinking about developing, and we're continuing to work on this, the SEL standards, as well as providing opportunities for teachers. Professional development is key for sustainability. Um, this is all of our work. Um, I see one of the questions here is about, um, you know, teachers, how do, how do we get teachers interested in this? Teachers have a lot to do with this. They greet the students on day one in the beginning of the class, middle of the day, at the end of the day. Um, but our job is to make it as streamlined as possible so it's currently embedded in everything that we do. It's not viewed as an add-on. Um, and so we're continuing to provide professional development opportunities so that our teachers feel well equipped to deliver the instruction, but also um, make some positive relationships with our students as well. If I could add just a couple of things to that too, things that um, help us integrate SEL uh, pedagogy without it feeling like an add-on are things like 
let's have consistent protocols for morning meeting, for instance. So everybody's got the same thing happening in morning meetings. Um, lots of teams have put together these social thinking units that start the year. Um, and we've got teachers who present to other teachers throughout our district at the beginning of the year around a lot of these practices. And so we've seen these practices increase. Also, in terms of them treating it like it's just another thing that they're responsible for, often they will speak to us about the challenge of classroom management um, and an increase in dysregulated students. And we have to keep bringing it back to, well, it really is about these social-emotional skills and developing these at an early age and developing and reinforcing them consistently throughout the system. Thank you. Um, so you've already sort of started to speak about some of the, the, the major challenges that you're dealing with. And I'm wondering if maybe we can have sort of a two-part question um, where you could talk first about maybe some of your biggest accomplishments related to SEL, and second, about maybe some of the biggest challenges. Absolutely, Josh. So I would say that um, in any major initiative, the biggest um, accomplishment is to prioritize it at the district level. Um, and we've done that. We have a leadership team who has prioritized this as um, one of our top three, top four priorities in our district. We've embedded it in our continuous improvement plan, um, which is also our guiding document that we reflect on. Um, another accomplishment I would say is that not only have we written this down and have prioritized it, but we're actually acting upon it. In our district leadership team meetings, we have developed a SEL design team. That team has been designed and developed to talk to the folks in our district about SEL practices. We recently conducted an inventory of SEL practices to get a better understanding of what is actually happening in our schools, what is all the great work that is um, happening so that we can build from what's working well. Um, and so we continue to do that. That team is also working with constituents in our districts to help develop our social emotional learning standards as well. So we're not only saying, yes, this is our pr priority, but we're actually boots on the ground and making sure that we're making we're moving the needle, essentially. Um, some of the biggest challenges, I would say, Josh, are not dissimilar to the challenges many districts face in terms of implementing large-scale initiatives. Uh, for us, especially in the world of uh, SEL, and as you mentioned previously, there's multiple frameworks. There's multiple practices. There's, we started with the three competencies. Now we've adopted the CASEL competencies. So there's lots of movement back and forth. Um, but I do think that for us, we've been fortunate and the state of Vermont has been um, very generous in supporting PBIS as a framework, not only for behavior, but embedding best evidence-based practices across all things behaviorally, socially, emotionally as well. And so that's been something that we've been able to benefit from. Um, again, and one other challenge that I would highlight too is just building the consistent understanding. Um, various people have different understandings of what SEL is and how it should be implemented. Um, it's, you know, it, it's a paradigm shift. This is the work for all of us in education. As Jeff mentioned uh, previously, we are seeing more students coming to school dysregulated, unprepared, um, not necessarily having the social emotional readiness for school. And so um, as a result of that, our mission is to, to really have our students be positive and responsible, involved citizens, be self-directed. And so it's really incumbent on us to focus on social emotional learning so that we can get to that end. And we'll continue to work on that. And I can add a challenge uh, that's been pretty specific to the high school because in K-8, you're really not, um, there's not a, a tremendous emphasis on measurement and grades because you're not creating a transcript. Once you're in high school, you're creating this permanent transcript that's used to, um, to demonstrate your college and career readiness. And so one of the big challenges for us in the high school and one of the reasons that we started this relationship with REL was that... Um, there was so much variability in how teachers viewed students' um, self-direction skills, collaborative, collaboration skills, um, 
there was it, it was incredibly inconsistent and some teachers were really struggling with creating that causal relationship between social emotional skills and academic performance um, so many times I would have conversations with folks that would say listen um, now that we've identified that we've separated in our grading system academic performance from um, our habits of learning I've got kids who are still pretty successful and proficient in academic but are woeful in some of their uh, self-direction skills and my response is there really ought to be that causal relationship where it should be almost impossible to be academically proficient if you are woeful uh, in social emotional learning so there has been a lot of professional development there's been a lot of work done on um, unifying our view and message around how to instruct support and assess the social emotional pieces and we still have a long way to go there because there's much more greater there's much greater variability in how we view those than there is in how we view our academic standards. All right. I want to I want to thank both uh, you, Jeff, and Cassandra Cassandra for sharing those responses. Um, with that, um, I do want to just turn this over to Julie Reardon, who is going to uh, facilitate a short Q and A with the audience. Um, with myself, Jeff, and Cassandra, um, using those questions we've received. So I'll turn it over to you now, Julie. Great. Thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks, everyone, for keeping the chat active with your questions. So try to get through all of them if we can the next few minutes. So um, Paul Smith had a question about using the surveys for screening purposes. I think this is uh, when we had our pull up about the purposes for using these um, instruments. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask Josh this question if he knows anything about the, you know, whether or not any of these instru instruments have been used for screening purposes, but at the same time ask folks in the audience to also let us know if you have used instruments in such a way. Josh, do you have any information about whether these have been used um, as screening tools? Yeah, I'm not sure if they've been used for screening tools. I can just say that, uh, you know, the measures included in this resource, um, you know, measure students' competence in three uh, specific social emotional learning skills. And, um, uh, sorry, a lot. Lost my, place, lost my train of thinking here. So, uh, so, sorry, universal screeners r really kind of typically look at a comprehensive uh, picture of student social emotional competence and targeted screeners, on the other hand, uh, really look at students' competence and specific skills. Um, and really in this search, uh, we didn't specifically set out to exclude uh, universal screeners. Uh, we would have certainly been open to including them. Um, provided that they met our eligibility criteria. I will just call out that the reason that many of uh, these screeners, such as the DEVRO Student Strengths Assessment, uh, really failed to meet our eligibility criteria is because they're not available online at free or, uh, for free or at a low cost. And so, um, you know, that being said, I, I just want to note that if you're using the universal screener and you're happy with it, um, I'd invite you to share that tool uh, that you're using in the chat so that others can learn from your experience. Great. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so we got a couple questions about professional learning and professional development. Um, so Diana asked whether or not any of these instruments provide professional development materials to help educators learn more. Uh, and Martha Montgomery asking uh, whether any professional learning has been developed for teachers uh, to build social emotional learning in students. So that's a more general question, but um, I, you know, maybe Josh, you could start and, you know, Jeff and or Cassandra chime in if you have anything to add. So this isn't a piece that we specifically looked at when we were um, reporting out on um, the information related to the instruments. Um, so that being said, I, I think I would turn it over to um, Jeff Cassandra to see if, if the instruments that you're currently using, whether or not there are professional development materials that are available for them. Yeah, Josh, so um, some of the materials, absolutely, um, especially with PBIS, so um, again, thinking about PBIS as complementary and really the framework in which to embed uh, many of our SEL practices. Um, so a lot of the evidence-based practices that our district is really subscribing to are um, one in particular is second step. Many of our schools, and we're trying to build consistency around this in our K-8 system. So um, with this, uh, making sure that schools are attending to social emotional learning. And second step is one of the evidence-based 
curricula out there that um, can provide um, great resources, professional development. Uh, we also have our school counselors who often will co-teach with classroom teachers as a way of modeling how to talk about social-emotional learning competencies, again, building the, the knowledge base of our teachers who do have a lot on their plate. How do we make it easier for them to understand and also realize this is just part of what we do as educators when we're doing math instruction. We do need to talk about self-regulation if we're going into a small group activity. Um, so yeah, we've also uh, subscribed to, as a district, that's also complementary under sort of our PBIS umbrella, is responsive classroom and developmental design. Jeff spoke about the advisory model. We use that in many of our middle schools, making smaller um, smaller communities with multiple um, staff members and teachers across subject areas. And that's really been a great avenue and venue for uh, teaching of some of the social-emotional learning competencies. I would also recommend CASEL's website. It has great resources as well, not only from like as a district, what are your priorities, it can walk you through that, but um, also some great resources that other schools have been willing to share around professional development materials for teachers. Great, thank you, Cassandra and Jeff. Um, we have another couple of questions around uh, the student populations. Uh, so Ace uh, Parsi asked, have you seen any implications for using these measures with your students with disabilities? Uh, are there frameworks that are particularly better or less suited um, to that population? So that's one question. Um, and another is, I'm interested to know if any of your schools or districts include student-teacher experiences at residential outdoor learning centers. So that's a more specific one. Um, and then a third, which is uh, about whether or not these instruments are mostly used with typical students or students with special needs. Uh, so I think this one might be, um, Cassandra and Jeff, this might be one for you all to take first. And then, um, Josh, if, if you found anything in the review that relates to that. Um, in terms of the question about um, students with disabilities, um, one of the things that we really focus on is access to all. All means all. So all students despite disability have access to all universal curricula support. Um, what we do though is in a situation as we would with any student, who has different learning needs is we look at the content and we would differentiate the content to meet those students' needs. Um, again, believing that all students, all means all, all students have access to all universal supports with certain students or students with diverse learning needs, it's important to really focus on that differentiation. And so that's where we would spend most of our energy on if that were the case. Great. And I, so Anything I would just that? add that, yeah, I would just add that, um, so earlier in the presentation I mentioned that only three of the 16 instruments had information on fairness. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, that sort of speaks to, so that's essentially indicating whether a measure is valid for comparing scores between different subgroups of students. Um, and so it kind of speaks to whether a measure, like I said before, was biased against some groups of students. And so I think it speaks to this, this issue that only three of the 16 instruments had information on fairness and just something that we should be mindful of as instrument developers, um, you know, are, are putting instruments out there that, that we are, in fact, uh, making sure that these are valid for all um, students. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, and so we did have another um, question about school counselors. Uh, most of Mariani asked, what about school counselors? Did the district use any SEL-specific programming or curriculum? That's a great question. So absolutely, second step is something that um, we have used as a district. One of the things that has been really helpful is uh, with our school counselors in our district and their understanding of ASCA, and the national standards for school counseling, they've been able to help us um, develop um, based on our um, graduation standards. Um, they've been able to help us think about how do we 
create learning targets for students in different grade levels based on our graduation standards. And so that's something that um, we're continuing to work on, but they, they've been really helpful in that, in that aspect of it. But second step is huge. Um, I think that's probably the biggest one that we're using right now in our district. Every school does have lots of autonomy, as many of our schools do, and so it really depends on the population that they're serving may dictate what specific curriculum they may choose. Right. Thanks for that. Um, I, we had a question from uh, about the SEL programs and evidence-based practice our high schools are using. So it's sort of a related. Um, I think you've sort of touched upon that as well. Um, so with the second step, it's um, then another question about can you speak to the student engagement assessment? What does it look like, and how did you determine questions? How is data compiled? Yeah, so um, I think the original intent was to, uh, well, actually, let me back up a little bit. A couple, couple years ago, I attended a workshop on um, gathering data to inform school improvement, and presenters there um, highlighted four categories that you should be gathering and analyzing data on all the time. And the four categories are demographics, um, student learning, uh, school processes, and perception data. And so perception data was defined as how do students, staff, community members, family members uh, perceive the experience they're having, the value of the experience they're having. And so we as a district, when we started analyzing these four categories, realized we were pretty ill-equipped in the perception data realm. And so what we did was we looked at what do we have, where we actually ask the students and the families how they feel about these experiences. And um, it was pretty inconsistent across the district, and it, was, uh, it wasn't really used in any kind of way that um, was advancing our practice. And so. The high school said, let's start with um, perception data from our students first. And so they, they built this, a, you know, a team of educators built this um, survey. They really wanted it to not be very long, so I think it's about 19 or 20 questions. It doesn't take that long to do. Um, and it asks a range of questions like, um, I have at least one adult in the building whom I trust um, if I am having any trouble, I can go to them. Um, my life outside of school is manageable. Um, the classes I'm most engaged in are X, and here's why. Things like that. So we, we really started um, by asking a really wide range of questions, and now what we're doing is we're trying to revise that tool more. Um, but we built it pretty organically. We looked at developmental asset screeners, um, we borrowed some of the language from them as well. Um, but we, we really wanted it to be an initial opportunity for us to, rec to give kids a voice and to recognize some things in students that we probably weren't um, recognizing in the past because we, quite frankly, weren't asking them enough or efficiently enough. Thanks, Jeff, for that. Um, well, listen, I think we've got those many questions. I think we almost got to all of the questions here, and a few of you have answered each other's questions in the chat, so it was great to see that as well. I want to thank you for joining us today. As I said earlier, today's webinar recording will be archived and uploaded to IES's YouTube channel. Uh, if you register for today's webinar, you will receive an email from us with a link to the recording when it is ready. Uh, just a reminder that we'd like your feedback. So. Um, Please take our survey. Uh, Jenny has posted it in the um, chat, uh, but this kind of feedback helps us to produce these um, events um, to be uh, most engaging for all of you. So we really appreciate your feedback on that. And again, thank you for your time. And if you have any further questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to contact today's presenters, uh, Joshua Cox, Jeff Evans, Cassandra Townshend. Their email is here on, on the screen, and again, we'll be uh, on the slide deck uh, if you can download it.